Again! It's over! He's done it again! Unbelievable! Oh, oh, straight into the roof of the net. Nice one. Straight down the middle. So, a good performance from both teams here today. Hi, you're watching First Post. I'm Rupa Ramni. Let's get started. Right, there's a lot lined up on the show today. We brought you the latest in the tussle between football superstar Lionel Messi and China. And here's more on that saga. Messi has finally broken his silence and sent out an apology. What did he say and why is it so important for Messi to damage control the situation with China? And speaking of damage control, England is not only losing the battle on the field, but clearly aren't thinking before uttering certain wise cracks. The cricketer Ben Duckett's comment of Indian cricketer Jaiswal taking inspiration from baseball has not gone down too well with all the former English cricketers. Nasser Hussain has come down hard on the player and the squad. And the entire team calling baseball a cult. And speaking of not thinking before uttering Pep Guardiola, fat shaming one of his players years ago has resurfaced. The player has come out saying he was hurt. What is the Pep Guardiola way and is that affecting players really? More on that in the show, but first, a look at all the headlines from Sports 360. We'll start with football. Italian club Napoli has fired head coach Walter Mazzari. The sacking comes two days ahead of the UEFA Champions League clash against Barcelona. Napoli are currently ninth in the Serie A points table. After winning the league title in the previous season, Mazzari will be replaced by Francesco Calzona, who was the assistant manager at the club. India have secured their first quota in equestrian for the Paris Olympics 2024. It's Anush Agarwal and it's in the dressage category. It's an event where the horse displays its gymnastic abilities and discipline. Agarwal's quota does not mean he is guaranteed to compete in the Olympics. He will only be allowed to take part once India approves his name for the Games. Over in tennis, Argentina's Facundo Diaz Acosta won his first ATP singles title yesterday. He beat Chile's Nicholas Harry 6-3, 6-4 in the final of the Argentina Open. Acosta began the tournament with a career-high ranking of 87 and that will now jump to 59 when the new rankings are out. Formula One's governing body, FIA, has released a statement. This is regarding the ongoing investigation into Red Bull's boss, Christian Horner. Red Bull launched a probe on the matter on the 5th of February. FIA says, and I quote, the FIA remains committed to upholding the highest standards of integrity, fairness and inclusivity within the sport. Honor denies all the allegations that have been made against him. The 2024 NBA All-Star Game between East and West faced the wrath of fans and pundits alike. The game ended with East beating West by 211 to 186 points. There has been a lot of criticism that the game received for its apparent lack of effort. Pundits have demanded for a change in the format to save All-Star Games prestige. And a documentary on legendary tennis player Roger Federer is under production. It will be helmed by Oscar-winning director Asif Kapadia. The documentary will revolve around the last 12 days of Federer's professional life. It's set to capture the most vulnerable and candid moments of the tennis star. The documentary will stream on Amazon's Prime Video. Now Lionel Messi misses a game and the story continues to grab headlines weeks after that. But if you are a Messi fan, that's Messi, that's bound to happen. Of course, the fans weren't enjoying this moment. Not everyone, though, has won eight Ballon d'Ors, right? So two weeks ago, Messi, as you know, Inter in Messi's team Inter Miami travelled to play a friendly against Hong Kong 11. Fans gathered in huge numbers to witness the World Cup winner, to witness the charismatic footballer. In fact, Messi was the biggest draw and the reason, prime reason why everyone flocked to the stadium in huge numbers. But to everyone's disappointment, Messi did not take the field, not even for a moment. And that enraged all present there. Fans were fuming. Organisers, David Beckham, Lionel Messi himself and everyone practically involved in this particular game faced severe backlash. Post the match, official complaints were made against the organiser, Tatler Asia. Fans even asked for a refund and the talks of Hong Kong 
hates Messi, started doing the rounds. The matter, of course, escalated so much so that political top brass got involved. Politicians tweeted about Messi not caring enough to play in Hong Kong. Amid the ongoing clamour for ticket refunds, Tatler apologised to football fans over Messi's absence and offered a refund. And what made matters worse was Messi taking the field and playing the friendly against Japanese club Vissel Kobe just days after the game in Hong Kong. Fans were livid that Messi played for 30 minutes in Japan. Messi made a short statement thereafter that he was in fact injured and that's the reason he didn't take the field in Hong Kong, but that was not appeasement enough. The Hong Kong government even questioned the injury. They said, and I quote, Messi played with ease in the match in Japan just three days after and he was spending quite a long time, that they said, on the pitch with some intense movement. And it didn't end or stop right here. Owing to the Hong Kong snub, at least that's how they see it and viewed it, China went ahead and boycotted Messi and Argentina by cancelling two friendlies that Argentina was set to play against Nigeria and Ivory Coast in the cities of Beijing and Hangzhou. Many alleged that Messi hates China, some going on to say, to the extent of saying that there was a political motive behind all of this. Now, I understand the angst, of course, of missing out on watching a superstar in action live in front of you, especially in the last phase of his career, but the extent of it has really quite snowballed, enough for the man in the centre of it all to finally break his silence. Just a while ago, talking, taking to Weibo, a Chinese social media platform, Lionel Messi has come out and made a proper statement. Hello everyone. I've read and heard many things that have been said after the game in Hong Kong. I wanted to record this video and give you the true version so no one has to continue reading false stories. As you all know, I always want to play and be involved in every game. I've heard people say that I didn't want to play for political reasons and many other reasons that are totally untrue. Had that been the case, I wouldn't have even travelled to Japan or visited China as many times as I have. Since the start of my career, I've had a very close and special relationship with China. He says he doesn't hate China and that's quite true. Messi has travelled for exhibition games and he's played a lot of football there. But there's more. He also clarified on his participation in Japan. Here is his defence. I had an inflamed adductor and I couldn't play in the first game in Saudi Arabia, which is when I felt it in the second game. I tried to play for a bit, but it got worse. Then on the day before the match, I tried to train and made an effort for all those who'd come to watch training. I did all I could. He did all that he could, says Messi, and having seen him perform at the biggest stage for so many years, you probably tend to believe that. One thing is for sure, Messi doesn't give up. This is the same Messi who doesn't give away the ball so easily. So it's safe to say that he would have done all that he could to take the field. Again, we're just trying to do the math here, basis what we see in front of us. Messi even stated that had he played the Hong Kong game, there would have been a greater risk of the injury only getting worse. I also went along to the football clinic with all the kids, but I really couldn't play. I felt discomfort and there was a risk it would get worse. It felt a bit better a few days later and that is why I played a bit in Japan to prepare fitness-wise for everything to come because I needed to play and get back up to speed. I had already said all of this, but I think it was important to say it again, now after everything that's been said. As always, I send good wishes to everyone in China who I've always had and continue to have special affection for. There it is again. He lays it on one more time, his love for China, to, in an attempt to soften the blow as much as he can. But why is it so important for Messi to try and broker this peace, try to sort of smooth things over? The thing to note here is that China can have far more influence in the sporting world than one can really imagine. Given the massive population of the country, brands obviously have a huge revenue share. The football icon wields immense influence in China and his popularity attracts luxury brands. Messi rakes in millions through global brand partnerships and a lot of it is based in China. Major Chinese companies like the dairy brand, Magnu, and the liquor brand, Shei Shui, the deals pay Messi more than $2.7 million a year. If these deals are to crash, it would affect Messi's global brand value. Not just that. Louis Vuitton is also endorsed by Messi. The luxury brand earns 32% of its sales revenue from Asia. Most of that coming from China and, of course, Japan. 
The recent Hong Kong misstep and a heartfelt apology two weeks later may sway China's consumer market for sure. And you'll just have to hope that it's done enough to smooth things over between him and China. Will the incident impact Messi's popularity though? And will fans forget the incident involving the superstar and move on? Well, we have to see how that one plays out. The number of times the word baseball has been used is incredulous and the expressions have changed over the course of the test series between India and England. It all started with England puffing up their chests and everyone talking of England's baseball putting pressure on the Indian cricket team and how that contest would really play out. And though it all started well for the visitors, the hosts have somehow cracked the code in terms of the kind of pitches to prepare that will successfully counter and negate the English tactics, resulting in the 2-1 lead that we see now. And this lack of foresight or skills to readapt and change tack by the England squad is getting some heavy criticism now. Former England cricketers are all up in arms and it's not just the on-field demeanour or the lack of it that is the cause for concern. Former England captains have lashed out at some of the irresponsible comments and statements that this English side has been making. We'll start with one that is currently in the eye of the storm. Ben Duckett, who scored 100 himself, may have been the only centurion here in the test and probably did most of the sensible batting, but clearly did not put any sense into his words at the press conference when asked about young Yashasvi Jaiswal's brilliant knock. Instead of applauding the opponent's intent and talent, this is what he chose to say. When you see players from the opposition playing like that, it almost feels like we should take some credit that they are playing differently than how other people play test cricket. Well, he just said that he, that they have to take, England has to take credit for the way a young batter in the opposite ranks completely outperformed the entire English side put together. Not the most wise thing to say, almost seeming like the patent of aggression is England's to own and there haven't been many examples in India is what that sort of amounted to. Well, it's, this is not the wisest thing to say, especially when England ended up losing the test the day after he said this. One of England's greatest cricketers and someone who is a super observer of the game was quick to call Duckett out and the England seniors for a statement like this even being uttered. The comment on Jaiswal that he has learned from us. I am going to touch on that. He has not learned from you. He has learned from his upbringing and all the hard yards he has put in while growing up. He has learned from the IPL. If anything, I would look at him and learn from him. Nasser's words cuts through with so much severity. He harshly puts Duckett and England in its place and has enough knowledge about the youngster in question here, Yashasvi Jaiswal, to say that it is his hard work that has got him here. And if there is some learning that has to happen, then England needs to learn from Jaiswal and the way he batted. A thought that is even mirrored by another former England cricketer. They need to look at the way Jaiswal and Shubman Gill played on day three. They soaked up the pressure for 30 or 40 balls and then they started to get boundaries. This is what test batting is all about. India have scored 875 runs in 228.5 overs. No one can tell me it's been boring watching India bat to you. But Nasser Hussain more importantly also goes on to point out a larger concern that he senses in the English dressing room. First, let's take a look at what he said. I hope they are going back into their room with self-introspection. I can look at that lad and learn from him. Otherwise, it becomes a cult, doesn't it? At times, baseball has been described as a cult where you cannot criticise either within or externally. Even in this regime, there is room for learning and improving. He's basically calling this current England squad out on their whole baseball approach. He basically says that they don't seem to be learning from their missteps, not adapting. He calls it a cult. Meaning there are, no, there are set rules and no one can really breach it or question it. Clearly those rules are not working and are only confusing some of the players further. Michael Vaughan, as we know, has lambasted the English side in the past, saying this defeat has exposed their method and that they needed to pick when to be aggressive. This was the worst defeat under Stokes and Brendan McCullum and one that exposed their method. They cannot take the aggressive way at every opportunity. They have to pick their moments. And when the criticism comes from someone who has just left the setup, who has captained them, 
then it's sure to hit home. Alistair Cook was also not too pleased either with the way the English team has gone about their cricket, making the statements that they would chase down any target, but not really following up the talk with the walk. Michael Vaughan, in fact, continued to be more scathing. He says clearly something has given and course correction is definitely needed. This England team are bent on doing things their way and saving test cricket. But ultimately, they have to be better than that now. They did not win in New Zealand. They did not win the Ashes. And if they carry on like this, they are going to lose in India. Clearly, there's a lot of anger and because of a few reasons. One, England seem to be caught between what the situation demands and what their method really should be and following it about their aggressive approach. And two, they do not wish to change their tactics or their strategy. They just want to continue doing what they are doing and expect the results alone to change and favour them. But this comment on taking credit for Jaiswal's batting was the icing on the cake. Definitely got Nasser Hussain fuming and why not? England's legacy and their cricketing tradition, their credibility even is on the line. And since the cricket is not helping, these statements certainly are only making it worse. Pep Guardiola, regarded as one of the greatest managers of this generation, does not, see, does not seem to put a foot wrong. The trophy cabinet is overflowing. Guardiola continues to be the best in the business. While some might argue that he always had the luxury of good players, others will say having the best players may not necessarily guarantee you the success. Ask England's supposed golden generation, the 2006 World Cup team, a bunch of excellent talents who appear to just stuff it on the world stage, going without a World Cup title. So yes, Guardiola's legacy cannot be disregarded. At Manchester City alone, Guardiola has won 16 trophies. That includes five Premier League titles, a Champions League and one each of Club World Cup and Super Cup. If that doesn't spell out exceptional managerial tenure, I don't know what will. The Spanish manager hasn't put a foot wrong, all except for one particular statement in 2022. No, that doesn't take away from his super resume and achievements, but it did jolt a player's confidence. The player in question is Calvin Phillips. Back in 2022, when Phillips came back to Manchester City after being with England's World Cup squad, Guardiola made a public statement about Phillips being overweight. More than a year has passed to Guardiola's statement. Calvin Phillips has now even made a loan move to West Ham. But why are we talking about this now, because some days back, the English midfielder decided to speak about this remark. He opened up about how he was affected by it. Philip said that Pep Guardiola's statement was a big knock on his confidence. He was right to do so. But there are different ways to go about it. It was just a misunderstanding. And I think he was very frustrated with me coming back one and a half kgs over my weight target. Phillips, of course, went on to also say that the comment and the backlash that followed also affected his family. It made them unhappy because clearly Phillips himself was sad by this. And it certainly made a difference to his career too. Phillips was, brought by, was bought by Manchester City for 42 million euros from Leeds United that very same year, 2022. After a good stint at Leeds and of course with the national side as well, where he was a regular starter. But as soon as he made the move to Manchester City, his downfall really started. Calvin Phillips made just two starts in a miserable 18-month spell with City. In fact, after Phillips made that statement and he came out about how he felt about being told that he was overweight, Pep Guardiola too opened up on the matter during a pre-match press conference. Listen in. Yeah, I'm sorry. Once in years is not bad. But I'm so sorry. I apologize to him. I do apologize. So I'm sorry. Before I get said to say, I spoke to him. Right. I never, never, before I said something here, I didn't speak with the teams, with the players in that case. He's so matter, matter of fact in his statement and almost seems like he isn't really apologising. But it's a dream for many footballers to actually pay, play for Guardiola. But not everyone has been a fan of the Manchester City boss's methods. Guardiola is also, he also strives to be the number one in the competition that he and his team features in. But this also means he expects a lot from his players. He's a taskmaster and that's just how his managerial way is. Calvin Phillips was 1.5 kgs, a little or close to 3 pounds overweight. And that made Guardiola issue a statement because he wants his players to be a certain way, to stick to their plans, to be disciplined because he too is that way. Now in the past, certain players have fallen out with Guardiola. On top of the list is Dante. 
Dante was managed by Pep Guardiola during his time at Bayern Munich. Despite being a regular starter, Dante was sold to Wolfsburg. After the move, Dante called out Guardiola and said that Guardiola was a tactical genius but isn't good dealing with players on a human level. That's quite a remark to make. Another top player who was equally frustrated with Guardiola was Yaya Toure. Toure was consistently ignored by Guardiola while they were at Barcelona. This forced Toure to make a move to Manchester City. But as soon as Guardiola arrived at City, Toure was on the bench again. Toure then made a move to his former club, Olympiacos. Toure and Guardiola's tussle was quite open and evident. Clearly, there was no love lost there. Remember Mario Goetze, the German who scored the winning goal in the 2014 World Cup final against Argentina. The goal that really shattered Messi's World Cup dream then. The player had a disappointing spell at Bayern Munich, again, when Pep was there. So much so that Goetze even called out Guardiola publicly after he moved away from Munich. Guardiola is brilliant from a technical perspective. On a personal level, he lacks empathy. He's a cold person that only cares about what happens on the pitch. Well, that wasn't the only thing that Goetze said. He even stated that Jurgen Klopp, the Liverpool manager and Guardiola's biggest rival, to be the better coach. So there is history, a history of grudging respect for Guardiola, yet no love really. But this doesn't seem to have bothered Guardiola. His mantra has always been the same. He wants to be the best. He wants his team to be the best. And his goal is to make his players perform 100% on the pitch. And in the quest of doing so, he might have upset a few of the players, clearly has rubbed them the wrong way. Guardiola's passion for football is evident even when he's not playing. His reactions from the sidelines clearly tells how driven he is, how much he cares about the sport and his team. Though they have become fodder for meme generators, truth is, if you wish to boast of a trophy-laden cabinet such as his, then you have to be, and you wish to be consistent and win at that highest level, you've got to be a little different. You've got to think out of the box to succeed because doing what everyone does will just get you only so far. We've come to almost the end of the show, but still some time left and it's time for last serve. Now, we watched the camels race some weeks ago in Saudi Arabia. We'll bring you a camel race, but this is with a twist. Take a look. Those fans driving by on those cars really cheered those riders, those female riders on. Quite a treat to watch. But that does it here on First Sports. Thanks so much for watching once again. I'll see you tomorrow.